the World of Warcraft Raids, Gameplay, Questing, and More panel. Your panelists are Craig Amai, Tom Chilton, Ian Hazakostas, Dave Kosak, Corey Stockton, and Greg Street. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so this panel, we're going to kind of pick up a bit where we left off at our intro panel yesterday, go over some raids, info, questing info, gameplay, and other systems that we didn't get to talk about yesterday, and then we'll have some time for question and answer right after that. So let me just jump right into this. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the raid content that we're going to have in Warlords of Draenor. Um, so yesterday I mentioned the Blackrock Foundry raid. This is going to be the capstone of the raid content that we launched the expansion with. As I mentioned, we're going to we, we're going to try to repeat the two-tier system that we had in Mists of Fendaria, where we have that sort of smaller intro tier that's available right away to kind of whet your appetite for raiding as most of the world is still leveling and gearing up and getting ready for that. And then a few weeks after that, we unlock you know sort of the real centerpiece of the intro expansion content, and that's going to be the Blackrock Foundry. Now, this is the center of the Iron Horde war machinery in the zone of Gorgrond. Um, it's going to be a 10 boss raid and non-linear layout. We have heard you guys, we miss Old War 2, we miss Ice Crown Citadel, that type of layout. There's a lot to be said for delivering both an epic raid. And so does one other guy. Exactly. Just that one guy, though. There's a lot to be said for delivering an epic raid in terms of scope, but also giving you the freedom to kind of work your way through a place more organically instead of just proceeding from boss 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. It's also nice to be able to choose what you're going to progress on and, and so forth. So we're happy to do that. And your goal here is going to be to dismantle the Blackrock Foundry from the inside, tear down the war-making capabilities of the Iron Horde, and face off against Warlord Blackhand, who is the chieftain of the Blackrock Orcs and heads up the Foundry as a whole. Now, this is a concept illustrating just kind of the general vibe we're going for here. Really, just a lot of, you know, this is smoke and soot and flame and, and dark iron. That's what the Iron Horde's all about. That's what their machinery is all about. Now, this is a temp, this is a sort of overall layout in 2D of what we're looking at for the structure of the raid as a whole. And you see there are three wings here. Um, there is sort of the, the first wing, which is mostly about melting down the ore into slag. Second wing, where that molten ore is forged and refined and shaped into weapons, armor, the engines of war. And then finally, an assembly wing, where all of that is put together, soldiers are armored up, the war machines are shipped off to the front lines. Now, we want to put this together really as something that has a very functional feel to it. This isn't you know, a place that was designed as a raid zone, this is a place that was designed as a foundry. And we want to get back to some of that interconnectedness that you got as you walk through old places like Upper Blackrock Spire or Blackrock Depths, where you can kind of look down and see the other parts of the zone going on around you. So just because you see this 2D layout where everything is spread out in different directions, that's really more just to kind of help us in our, in our conceptualization of the zone. But the thought is three separate wings, and then once you've cleared all of these wings, you can access the crucible that you see at the top of this layout where Blackhand himself awaits. Now, Part of, our, part of what we'd like to do in having nonlinear layouts is also really preserve some of the freedom that players currently doing flexible mode may be used to in how they approach the zone. Right? If you're doing Siege of Orgrimmar today, at this point, if you want to just queue up and face off against Garrosh directly, you can do that if you're doing flexible. Now, with our new raid structure, it's going to be something that you just zone in the front door for instead of queuing, but we want to preserve some of that freedom. So we envision some things such as maybe once you've cleared all the wings a certain number of times, maybe you can forge a key that lets you directly access the crucible later on if your raid leader has that ability. So you don't necessarily have to feel like if you have to re-clear nine bosses just to get to the tenth every time. And in general, you have as much freedom and be able to plan your raid week the way you want. Speaking of the new raid structure, um, I'd like to revisit this slide from yesterday's panel. I know there were a lot of questions and I've definitely heard a lot of interesting discussion coming out of this. I just wanted to clarify how this is going to work overall. 
So in Warlords, um, we're going to have ultimately three different difficulty tiers for organized raid content. Raid Finder, more or less unchanged. The Raid Finder of Warlords is going to be the Raid Finder you know today, with some addition of flexible scaling tech to help a bit with queue times, to help with you know minimizing waiting time if people have to leave midway. But other than that, we see the normal mode in Warlords really being equivalent to what flexible mode is today in difficulty and in overall you know in our overall philosophy towards it. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to call a difficulty flexible once flexible really is the norm and how the majority of our rating is going to work in Warlords. If you are a normal mode guild today, you will find heroic content likely suitable for you in Warlords, except that that will now scale from 10 to 25 flexibly. And if you're a heroic guild today, our 20 player mythic content will be for you. Now about the raid structure, one of the awesome things about this and one of the things that makes flexible rating as a style great is the freedom that it gives you to raid with friends that maybe can't necessarily make all of your raids, people that you know may log on late for the raid one night, they can hop in, and you can also participate without necessarily feeling a sense of obligation where you're letting creepy people down if something comes up and you can't make it. But what this also means is that all of our raiding except for Mythic will be fully cross-server enabled from day one. That is normal, that is heroic. So when High Mall or when the Blackrock Foundry opens up, if you have, you know, you want to join our, some real life friends on another server for their normal mode raid on the weekend after you do heroic with your guild, you can do that, or vice versa. We really want to give the maximum amount of flexibility to be able to play with your friends and experience the content as you choose. I think cross-server mythic would be a bit messy with things like realm firsts, and for the most part, mythic guilds are grounded to a single server, so we're keeping it that way. Um, each difficulty has a separate lockout. So you don't have to worry about, you know, oh, I did heroic with my guild on Wednesday, so I can't join my friend's raid on the weekend. It also means there's no more dynamic difficulty switching because everything is its own lockout, which has some other interesting implications. Right now, you have the UI interaction very frequently if you're a normal or heroic raider, where you say, let's switch the difficulty to heroic for this boss, then back to normal. Well, when you're doing mythic raiding, for example, you're just doing it as a standalone raid. It means we can also have mythic trash, I know everyone really has wanted Mythic Trash if you've been dying for it for years. Okay, maybe not. But you can get Mythic Trash loot, which is something. Gastropods. Just, yeah, just wait for the Mythic Gastropod. It moves like 10 times faster. <laughs> um, and now the way these, the way these lockouts are going to work also is that they're very similar to the current flexible lockouts in that they're loot-based lockouts. That is to say that you can be in the raid with the, with the boss alive that you've already looted that week. However, you just can't loot it again. So again, if you want to help out a friend, if someone asks you to join them later on, you're not going to be able to loot the same boss twice because that would be all kinds of problematic, but you're completely free to raid and join groups as you see fit. Uh, currently, the way flexible raids work, you go through the interface and you queue up for it, you're teleported into the zone. That's a concession ultimately that we made to just get the raid finder functionality, or sorry, to get flexible raid functionality into the game and in your hands for Siege of Orgrimmar, which we think is very well worth it and awesome. But in the long run, since this is normal raiding going forward. This isn't some special mode. This is just how raiding works. You walk in the front door, you form a group, you zone into the instance, and you are raiding, except it scales flexibly. The only raid activity that's going to work through queuing through the UI and teleporting is going to be raid finder. So, how does loot work, many people have asked. Does this mean that personal loot is now the norm for heroic raiding? No. Uh, again, personal loot, or personal loot as it currently stands is really well suited to groups of strangers in Raid Finder or pickup groups where maybe it lets you not have to deal with, do you trust someone to be the master looter? Do I trust this guy's not gonna ninja loot and run off with things? But when you're playing with your guildmates, when you're playing with your friends, you want the ability to trade items to those who need them more than you. If someone comes back to the game after a while, maybe you want to kind of train them through and dump a bunch of loot in their laps so that they can really get caught up quickly. Maybe you want to pass something to someone for their 4 piece set bonus. All those things need to be possible, we feel, and that's how loot is going to work in normal and heroic mode. So that raises the question, of course, well, how is the drop going to work? If I have 13 people, do I get 2.6 loots? What, what is 0.6 of a loot? The answer is actually 0.6 of a loot is 60% chance to get a third loot. So the thought is that this will scale smoothly where the ratio of loot drops per eligible player remains constant throughout. 
we really want to avoid and continue to work on avoiding any perception of breakpoints or magic numbers when it comes to making these flexible groups. That's something we've certainly learned and heard from the community as this has played out. We never want you to feel like when your friend asks to join, you say, oh no, that's going to put us over some invisible threshold. We also don't want you to feel like you need to go out and find some random warm body to get over some threshold. Um, in addition to loot, one of the things that we're working on doing is streamlining the way some of our ability targeting and logic work again, to avoid breakpoints. In many cases today, you have cutoffs where when you bring a 15th player, suddenly three people get targeted by some boss's ability instead of two. Again, we feel like with most abilities, we can probably randomize in a way that avoids the existence of breakpoints. So for example, to use a Siege of Orgrimmar example, uh, Sun Tenderheart in the Fallen Protectors encounter cast Shadowward Bane. Shadowward Bane hits two, two people if you have 10 players, five people if you have 25. Today, the second you go from 14 to 15, it starts hitting a third person, which makes many people, I think, somewhat justifiably feel, well, we should try to avoid having 15. 14 is kind of a magic number. Well, if instead it just hit when you had 14, it had an 80% chance of hitting three, 20% chance of hitting two, over the course of the fight as a whole, you're still going to see the same number of debuffs on average, but you're never going to feel like you're hurting yourself by bringing an extra person. Now, there are some mechanics that, that won't necessarily work for, like prisons on Shaw of Pride, where you re it's actually really important to know exactly how many you're going to go out. You don't want to be caught by surprise or have to be random every time. But for the most part, we're going to do everything we can do to avoid the existence of breakpoints when it comes to mechanics, when it comes to loot, and to really make it feel like, OK, you have 17 people online, go rate with 17. You have 12 online, go rate with 12. Just play with your friends, have fun, enjoy the content. Now I'm going to hand it off to Craig, who's going to talk a bit about some of the quest revamps we have coming up. Thank you, Ian. Hello, BlizzCon. Uh, all right, let's talk about quest. So one of the first things you're going to notice when you step into Draenor is that we're calling out key storylines through icons on our quest tracker and our quest log. Uh, essentially, we want to draw attention to the big quest chains with big characters that lead towards big rewards, so you can make intelligent decisions about what content you want to participate in, what you want to focus on, especially as you reach that kind of end of the zone point where you're considering moving on. While those key storylines are guiding you through zones, you're going to be noticing that a lot of the other quests outside of those chains are more distinctly separated. So you, you really have the choice of whether you want to participate in additional quests along the way or whether you want to follow just that primary story track. Uh, this will have the side effect also of making the world feel a little bit more full and organic. If you go wandering out and find a quest hub, there won't be a magic quest that unlocks it and, and makes all the quests there start appearing. Um, and it'll give you a lot more control over your experience. The, the efficient route will still be follow those key storylines, pick up the other quests along the way. But if you've been doing dungeons a fair bit, or again, if you're reaching the, the end of a zone, you may choose to focus on those key storylines and not be picking up as much of those strictly optional quests. As you go through these zones questing, you'll notice we're list we'll be using a lot more um, of these side systems, dynamic events and treasures, that we first introduced on Timeless Isle. Uh, so dynamic events are essentially gameplay challenges with cool rewards behind them and minimap callouts. So uh, on Timeless Isle, they, they, for the most part, they were soloable rare spawns. But as you step into Draenor, you're going to be seeing some more complex versions, some multi-stage events with big culminations, or some uh, wandering raid bosses that encourage lots of players to pile up and, and get, uh, overcome a big social challenge. Um, those, these will be mixed in a lot more during the level up experience. You'll also be seeing them a lot at, at level 100. So it should make the, uh, the entire experience feel a little bit more, uh, again, organic. Uh, make, make it feel like there are opportunities coming up outside just the questing experience. Um, treasures are essentially our way of encouraging you to explore the world even more than the art already does. We make beautiful worlds, and we want to reward you for peeking in every nook and cranny. So the idea with treasures is when you find that hidden path that leads up the mountain and the quest never took you up, it's very likely there will be something at the top of it that makes it worthwhile to go up there. Um, we also want to, with our treasures, kind of support just little mini stories within the world. So a couple examples you'll see in Frostfire. Uh, when, you, when you go into one of our ogre towers, you might run into a little bird's nest up on a rafter that just has a sparkling gem in it that you can loot for a cool reward. Or you might run into uh, an iron horde caravan that's become entrenched in snow with some iron horde troops trying to dig out the wheels. And if you kill them, there's a chest on the back of their caravan that has a cool reward in it. Um, 
you expect these to be very frequent because as we have that goal of encouraging exploration, we want to make sure that we're doing it effectively all over the world. Another thing you'll be seeing is uh, what you might be used to from the reward scheme for quests is that you'll run into a lot of green items along the way and then cool blue items at the, long, uh, at the end of essentially key storyline chains. Uh, what you'll be running into now is that there's going to be a lot more uh, opportunity for rewards to spike during your questing experience. So a reward that might be green for one player might actually end up being blue or epic for another player. It'll become less predictable, a little more exciting as you're questing through. Uh, we also have a fair number of UI updates that are, that are coming in with Draenor. Uh, I want to give you a sneak peek at a few of them. So here you'll notice the special icons uh, next to some, some of the quests in the quest log. Those are the key storyline icons I was talking about. Above them, you also notice that we're calling out your, the number of key storylines that exist in a, in a zone in the form of chapters here, two out of six. Uh, this will help you actually have a rough gauge of your progress through a zone, so you can make, make choices about whether you want to finish that zone off versus moving on to another one, depending on how far you are through. Uh, the other thing you'll notice here is uh, the quest banks on the map. Those are actually calling out the locations of key storylines that you haven't yet picked up or that maybe you abandon along the way. So these will actually dynamically update if you went halfway through a storyline and stopped. They'll show you where you can pick back up on that storyline if you want to. Uh, this, uh, this should make it a lot easier to uh, figure out exactly what you need to do to knock out those zone achievements, finish off a zone without you know, asking for help from CS or anything. Uh, max level content. I want to talk about this a little bit while we're here, too. Um, so we had the philosophy going from Cataclysm into Mists of Pandaria that we wanted to provide you a lot more things to do when you reached max level. Uh, well, that philosophy still stands moving into Draenor. We want to give you lots of options, a lot of opportunity for things outside of just dungeons and raiding, things that, things that you can do in the outdoor world. So in Draenor, you'll be seeing more max level content than ever before, but I can promise you right now that little, if any, of it is going to be daily quests. So there's a couple key uh, st uh, content structure philosophies we locked in on on Miss and Pandaria that we really liked. Uh, one of them was the, the progressive long-term storylines behind the Dominance Offensive and Operation Shieldwall dailies. The, yeah, the, the chapter-based kind of like leave you off on a cliffhanger, pick it up again in a few days or a week type, type content to take you through a big story over a longer duration. Uh, the other content structure we, we really liked the success of was the more open-ended structure inherent with Timeless Isle with the, the exploration, the deep reward systems, options for how you want to participate your content. We essentially want to marry those two structures and create big zones with lots of opportunity, freeform, uh, freeform content that have these, these long-term progressive story lights that thread through them over the weeks so you keep uh, having reason to go back and, and dive into them even deeper. Uh, the one other type of max, max level content you might be seeing a bit more of in Draenor is essentially uh, environmental gameplay in the form of, I guess you would have seen it in our Troves of the Thunder King uh, loot room scenario. Uh, what, we want to, what we want to push forward is opportunities to use all those class abilities in the outdoor world that sometimes only apply to PvP or, or top-end raiding. Opportunities to play out your, your race and your class to its unique advantages to try and squeeze out extra rewards. So you'll be seeing a little bit more of that at max level too. Uh, so that's a, that's a good overview of our max level content. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about garrisons. I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Corey. I'm uh, just going to jump in and reiterate some, some of the points. You know, our overall goal with our, our questing system is it really we wanted to create a more dynamic world, a more organic experience this time, and really kind of break you out of your patterns that you have while you're questing so that you see more happening around you. Uh, and particularly at max level, we experimented a lot in Pandaria, and some of those experiments we think worked out really great. Some of them were the Golden Lotus, but we tried a lot of things. And uh, I think you'll see some of those more successful experiments roll up into the next expansion, because we really want to have a lot to do out in the world while you're exploring this, this, this great world of Draenor. Right on. So now we're going to get into some garrisons. Anyone that was here yesterday for our talk, we kind of did an overview of the system. And today we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into how some of this stuff works. So when you build your garrison, you get a, uh, a certain number of buildings that are already there to begin with. Um, these are things that we didn't think would, f they didn't really fit the paradigm of 
taking this structure and getting to place it anywhere anywhere in the uh, the garrison, like a mine, for example. A mine kind of has to be placed in a specific spot. Um, the town hall is your main building. That's the building you're going to go to to interact with the guys that are running your garrison and send your guys on missions. Um, so that's got a predefined spot, and it upgrades with your garrison as it goes. Um, after you have starting buildings, you'll get the chance to build your first small building. Uh, here's a list of uh, all the small buildings that you can build. Uh, all of our profession buildings are considered in the small category. Um, and this really fits the kit of what we were talking about yesterday, where you'll be able to uh, actually uh, dabble into professions that your main character doesn't have. So for example, let's say you, uh, you find a follower, and that follower is an engineer. You can now choose to build the engineering works building, assign that follower to that building, and then you can now run missions to get recipes for engineering and build engineering items, but you're actually not even an engineer. You're a blacksmith miner, for example. It's a really cool way to integrate it into the, the gameplay. So moving on, now we have medium buildings. This is kind of the, the next step up uh, from smalls. Uh, it's a wide variety of buildings here. The inn, we talked a little bit about the inn yesterday. That's a place that you could find new followers. Um, this will also be the place that you can get the pet stable, uh, which is a, a building that's very unique, unique to pet battles. You'll be able to come here. Uh, there'll be a trainer here you can fight. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do here that'll be just based around having that one unique building. Uh, next up would be large buildings. Uh, these are the things that you would expect to see like in a, in a Warcraft 3 base. Things like your barracks, right? your armory, your mage tower. Um, these are really these defining large buildings that are going to set the scale for your garrison. Each of these buildings has a bonus. Um, it, these buildings have some of the best bonuses because they're the, they're the largest ones that you can get. So things like the barracks will increase the amount of followers you can actually have. Uh, at any one time. So you're going to want to have more because they're out getting that loot for you. So the more followers you can have out on missions, the better chance you have to get new loot. Now how do the buildings work? As we talked about yesterday, they upgrade over time. Uh, so you start out with a building. Now each building has its own unique upgrade. So that, uh, that barracks that you built, it'll start out uh, you know, looking kind of doinky, kind of small. But over time, you can get cooler and cooler versions that'll make it look more badass, more awesome, and it'll increase the bonus. So here's a, a, a look at a screenshot from our mock-up UI of how this would work. Uh, you can see the tooltip there on the infirmary that right now it's level one, but at level two, it increases the bonus. Um, you, obviously, you'll have to pay a cost to get that, but you'll, deal with, you'll do all of that through this UI. You'll be able to come to the building, choose to upgrade it, wait a little bit of time, and then you'll get that new bonus. Now, how do we get the upgrades? Some upgrades you're just going to be able to purchase just for gold or currency. Um, but we really want to get this feature to be something that feels like a part of the world. So we're going to drop a new item called blueprints. And you'll be able to find blueprints all over the world lots of different ways. They could be a faction reward, quest reward, uh, a random drop in a zone. When you find it, you just right click it, just like a recipe for a profession, and then you can go back to your garrison and now you'll know how to build that upgrade for that building. Where are these plans? Anyone that's played the pet battle system will be familiar with this concept here. Um, so on this infirmary, to get the level three blueprint, we tell you where it is in the world. We show you it's a drop, it's in Frostfire Ridge. We could do the same thing with faction or wherever it would go. So you don't need to hop out of the game and go somewhere to try to find that info. It's right here available to you. Now yesterday we talked a little bit about this too, about specializations. This allows you to customize a building once it gets to rank three. So buildings have a total of three upgrades, and when they hit that third upgrade, you unlock the ability to specialize it. So here's a look at what that would, what that would look like in game. Um, you can see this armory has three specializations. Uh, currently, we're thinking we'll let you change the specialization probably once each day. Uh, we might put a, a cost on it to change the specialization. We don't want you swapping it all the time, but we definitely want to give you the option to change it without too much trouble. It's a really cool reward for getting rank three of a building. Not only do you get the new art, the better bonus, but you get this piece of customization that you can do to it. Some buildings will let you assign followers to them. The example I gave you guys about the engineer a little earlier, uh, all the profession buildings can have a follower assigned, but you can also assign followers to, uh, to other places, like the mine, for example. 
you could find a miner, assign him there, and then he could actually uh, work offline while you're gone and collect ore for you. And then what you could do is you could come back into the garrison, go to that building, and collect that ore from him when you log back in. Here's a look at what that would look like. Here's a mine. You can see uh, we've got an orc there working away, generating a specific amount of ore per hour. Um, but you, it's not like this is free, right? Because that follower, he's working at this mine, but he could also be out running a mission for you, trying to get loot. And that's where a lot of the gameplay really comes into running your garrison. You're going to have to make decisions about, I have these followers. Do I want to have them do things for me in the garrison, uh, trying to learn profession recipes, gathering resources? Or do I want to send them out on a mission and have them try to bring back you know, gear for me? You have to really make those choices. So the garrison itself upgrades as a whole. You have buildings that upgrade, but you're going to need a place to put all those buildings. So your garrison starts small, but as it grows, it will give you more plots to put things in. So here's a look at how that UI would work. This garrison is currently at tier two. It can go up to tier three, and you'll get three more building slots, allowing you to get more bonuses, find more followers that you can assign to those buildings. It's, it's really a system, it works like your character, right? Every time you level, you get an opportunity to do more things and do more stuff, and that's really the concept here. We want the garrison to grow with you. Now, how do you get it to actually change from one tier to the next? You have to fill all the plots. So let's say at uh, rank two, your garrison has six plots. Once you get a building in all six of those plots, you'll unlock the ability to upgrade the garrison as a whole and move it to the next tier. Those plots come in three sizes, and you just have to match up the, the building size with the plot size, and then you can place that building anywhere you want in that garrison, as long as the plots match up. So here's a look at the garrison map in-game. This is rank one. So we've got uh, five plots here for players to use. This is what you start with. Then you go into rank two, and you can see we've added a few more plots here. Uh, the, the, a mage tower has been placed, an infirmary. And finally, here's uh, rank three. And this, everything's unlocked in this garrison. There's still a few empty, uh, empty spots for players to fill here, but you can really get the vibe of how big it grows with you. So you've got followers, you've got buildings. What do you do with them? You need to send them on missions. So let's talk a little bit about how that would work. Missions can be a number of different activities. Um, here's an example of, of a few, how it would work in game. You can send them on a quest. You can do a scenario. You could obviously run a dungeon, and even you can run raids. Raids, we're thinking, are going to take multiple days to run, uh, but it's really that cool, epic feeling that these followers you find can do awesome, cool things. They're not just hanging out. You can send them out to actually fight for you. The difference between all these activities is they take a different number of followers. So a quest you can run with a single follower, whereas a dungeon, you would have to combine five followers together and send them off. So how do you assign them? Here's a look at that UI. So your followers are listed out here on the left. On the right, you've got a list of missions. In this case, they're dungeon missions. And you just drag followers into those slots. You can see those, those lists of icons down there on the right side. Uh, those are basically traits for the mission. And what you want to do is try to match those traits up with the abilities on your follower to get a bonus. So let's say uh, there's a mission uh, where you're, you've got to kill orcs. There's an ability on followers called Orc Bane. You want to try to match those two together, and then you'll get a bonus on that mission, and you'll do better at it. So next up, you select the mission here. We show you the, the difficulty of the mission. So as you're dragging the followers into the UI, it's going to dynamically change and try to give you a little bit of help and know uh, this is something you can do probably pretty easily. This mission, you might have a chance to fail at it, so you really want to decide, do I want to send those guys on it or not? And of course, when you're done, you send them off and wait for them to bring back your sweet loot. So that's a little bit of uh, some more details on how garrisons will work. I'm going to hand it off to Greg, and he's going to talk to you about some of the system stuff coming up. I was going to elaborate a little bit, because one of the things that I think is important to call out is that um, even though you're using that UI to assign your, you know, your follower that has mining into the mine, the mine is an actual physical place in your garrison. So when you go there and you go inside the mine, you'll actually see your follower hard at work, you know, maybe you can whip him a little bit or whatever it is you want to do, you know, if he's a lazy peon. Um, but 
you know, maybe the or something like that. <laughs> so you can go in there and you can, you'll even be able to get some mining nodes yourself. And even that mine upgrades over time. So the mine is able to get bigger. Um, so you're able to get access to more nodes, stuff like that. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about social philosophy. I hinted at this yesterday, but ultimately, we want World of Warcraft to be a game that you play with your friends. We think you guys will have more fun. We think you'll build connections. You'll ultimately probably stick with the game longer. So what we're really going to try to do in Warlords is to encourage you to play with the friends you already have. We're trying to remove the barriers that stop that from happening. And we'd also like you to encourage you to make new friends. There was once upon a time before we offered so much um, random matchmaking where you would, hey, this guy's a really good tank. Maybe next time I run a dungeon, I want to find this guy. Nowadays, we can provide a tank. You know, sometimes it takes a little longer than others, but we'll probably get you a tank at the end of the day, and there's less motivation to, to play with your friends. I, I like this anecdote with the guys in my office. One day, I turned around, and um, one of the dudes was running a dungeon. I'm like, man, if he had asked me, I would have run it with him. But it was so easy just to jump into the dungeon himself that, you know, maybe I wanted to get a cup of coffee or something first. And it was easier just to random match make than to play with a guy sitting right next to him. So the random matchmaking isn't going anywhere. We're still going to have Dungeon Finder. We're still going to have Raid Finder. But we kind of want that to feel like a last resort. That's what you do when your friends aren't online or, you know, you're between friends. You start a new job. You've got to find a, a different group. We're going to try to make Raid Finder feel a little more like um, tourist mode. You're there to see the content and experience the bosses and get to tell part of the story, but we're going to try to encourage people to also experiment with what normal and heroic feel like. So how are we going to support all of this um, enhanced socialness? We've talked a lot about flexible rating. Something else we're going to do is finally add a, um, a pretty good group finder. We have a raid browser in the game today, and it's pretty terrible. And you guys probably forgot it was there. You can still access it. It's kind of a trick to find it. But we think this feature can um, be a lot bigger, a lot cooler, compete with, um, with the random matchmaking stuff that's already out there. There are some mods and add-ons that people have developed to do this already, and there's a ton of demand from you guys, so we're going to do it. It's going to be very browser-based. You can make a group to do anything. If you want to go back and work on your Shadow Morn, you want to go make a group to kill world bosses, you want to make a, a, um, a rated battleground team, you can do all of that here. It's all cross-realm. You can browse through, find a group of people that look like you want to hang out with, and get a group together. Stacking the deck is a, um, a new type of buff that you'll see in Dungeon Finder. Currently, we have the luck of the draw, where we give you rewards to encourage you to play with um, people in the random queue. Believe it or not, at the time, we were worried that people wouldn't use Dungeon Finder, so you had to like, give you a little bit of extra incentive there. And that worked out really, really well. So the way stacking the deck will work is it will give you a different type of bonus, in this case, bonus valor. Imagine you get 10% bonus valor for every friend that you queue with. And then that last bullet is indicating that if you do use Dungeon Finder for a random group and you get to the end, you're like, hey, this worked out pretty well. Do you guys want to requeue? That will then count as a pre made group and you will also get the stacking the deck bonus. All right, let's talk about leveling. 10 levels are back. And we really want leveling to feel exciting. Um, we made the change to the talent tree in, in Mist for a lot of good reasons, and we're really happy with that change overall. But it's a totally fair criticism that getting a new level doesn't feel as exciting as it did in the old day. Even getting plus 1% crit, as lame as that was, was better than getting nothing. But we want to stop handing out so many new abilities. We don't think it's going to be a great experience if you get 10 new buttons to stick on your bars as you level up from 90 to 100. This has been kind of a long time coming. Um, it's amazing to kind of see the turnaround in the community that now everyone's like, you know what, I'm, I'm good. I don't need any more abilities. Stop giving me new abilities. 
So what we're going to try is from level 91 to 100, as you level up, you'll get some type of upgrade to one of your core spells. Some of these will introduce class changes that we already were planning on making to kind of make it feel like a bonus as you level up. But to be totally fair, some of them are just going to be passive bonuses. Um, think of them kind of like the old school spell ranks, except you won't have to visit your train or anything like that. You always gain a little bit of power just from gaining a level, but we're going to put a really big boost behind some of your spells so you can really feel it. Like, if you suddenly had 20% bonus damage to execute, that's something you're going to feel the next time you go kill someone. But don't expect a ton of class changes overall. Like I said, a lot of these are going to be passive bonuses, not change for change's sake, just to give you a level 93 reward. These are um, some sample leveling rewards. Hopefully they'll stick, but it's the kind of ideas that you can see that we're playing with. Okay, let's talk a little about items. So, our philosophy with itemization, this is like the best reward we can give out in the game. And it's really disappointing when the best reward we can give out in the game feels a little lame. We really want getting a new item to feel exciting. We think part of the problem here is all the modification you have to do when you get an item. It's, it's really disappointing. You get a new helmet and you're like, oh man, I'm not going to get a meta gem. Uh, maybe I'll just keep it in my bag for a while and maybe I'll get something better. That's awful. It's time to stop the madness. Hit and expertise. Um, one of our core design values is to make something feel like a bonus. And we think we're at the point where hit and expertise don't feel like a bonus. You have to get to these magic numbers before you feel like you're really fully functional as your spec. Similar, um, Dodge and parry are cool mechanics. Like, it totally makes sense that you're super nimble dude and you dodge out of the way of the dragon claw, but it just hasn't worked out really well as dodge and parry rating that you stack on gear. And we know, particularly lately, tanks are kind of bummed when they get avoidance on their gear. And remember, I'm going to talk a little bit about items here, but yesterday we talked about how we're going to clean up your bag space. I don't want anyone to freak out at all the different types of items we're going to drop, so hopefully you'll have a little more room to deal with it. So, I think I have to credit Travis Day with the initial gone slide, but here we go. <laughs> now, again, your warrior will still be able to dodge. Maybe we can have more interesting mechanics, like following a successful whatever, you have a higher chance to parry the next attack, but you won't see it on gear. We will have tanking stats, and I can talk about that in a sec here. Oh, reforging. This is what we call an idea that sounded good on paper. But what it turned into is this terrible cascade where you get a new piece of gear, and now you have to reforge all of your old gear to hit some cap. And yeah, it'll be a little better without hitting expertise, but things like haste caps and crit caps are still out there. And overall, we think it just drags down the excitement of getting a new item when you know you're nowhere near being able to put it on yet. And there's more. I like how we could get that kind of cheer when we introduced reforging and the same cheer when we get rid of it. It's awesome. Then 7-0 will bring it back. It's reverse <laughs> psychology. We'll get rid of it. Um, enchants are one of those other things. We really want enchants to feel like a bonus. Back in the day, you would get your avalanche, your crusader, whatever, on your weapon. That was a really big deal. Since then, we've kind of gone overboard, as, as we tend to do. And you're putting enchants on your bracers and stuff like that. What we really want to do is have a system where fewer items overall can be enchanted, but there's more choices for those individual items. So maybe we'll make multiple weapon enchants and you pick the one that's good for your spec or your playstyle. 
I feel like I'm beating down on some of the professions a little bit here. Don't worry, we'll try to figure out to make sure to minimize the economic impacts to enchanters out there. But we don't think it's fair to everyone to have to deal with so many enchants just so you can have a little bit of gold in the bank. We're going to do something similar with gems. Um, very few items are going to have gem sockets, but when they do, they're going to be a really big deal. They'll be something exciting. You might only have a gem on a couple of your tier pieces, for example, but it'll be a pretty, pretty big stat bonus. I don't think we'll do any like multiple socketed items, so there's no reason to have um, set bonuses again. And likewise, we think meta gems aren't really a decision. You just get the one that's right for you as a healer or a DPS, and, and that decision's over. But if you think of the way like Warforging works today, where there's a random chance that your item could be a little better, there's a random chance that it might have a gem on it. So you might get a weapon, and then a few days later, you get a weapon with a gem socket on it, and now you have the decision of, you know, is this an upgrade you want to use? Do you want to pass to one of your buddies in the group, and so on? Whoa. Nobody's happy but the paladin when the int plate drops. So going forward, we're just going to have plate. If plate drops and you're a plate using class, it's potentially something you can wear. Same thing is true of male leather and cloth. So the way this will work is... This is awesome. I get all the good slides. If you're a rep paladin, like most of you are, the plate will have strength on it. If you change to your holy spec, the strength on the plate will change to in, and you can just wear that. most popular change ever made. So even in like PvP, for example, they'll just be the priest set from now on. You don't have to, you know, decide you want the healer one or the DPS one. So I'm talking strictly about armor here, so you know, helmet, shoulders, legs, all of those very visible pieces. We still want jewelry, cloaks, trinkets, and weapons to be more role-focused. If you talk to healers, most, many of them will tell you that spirit is actually a pretty interesting stat, and you can decide how much spirit you want on your gear in a way that, say, the mage can't decide how much hit they want on their gear. So jewelry, cloak, trinkets, weapons can still be more role-focused. You might have items with spirit, in which case the healer would be interested. You might have an item without spirit, in which case other people might be interested, or the healer might be as well. Some of these will be less, um, I guess, spec agnostic, so they'll be more spec agnostic, so they may just have attack power or spell power rather than being like the agility spirit item. And then to replace the loss of dodge and parry, we think we're back at a place where we can just put armor as a good tanking stat. Active mitigation has worked out really well, and we think there's room just to have um, armor. It won't be the, you know, the stat on every piece because it's not going to be on all of your actual armor, but it can be on things like the rings and cloaks. Tertiary stats. So it might seem like we're really streamlining gear here, um, but what we're really trying to do is give it a long tail. It's not fun when you go for a long time and don't get your weapon and feel like you're just really far behind everyone else. But at the same time, we don't want you to gear up, you know, in two weeks and be done, and then say, like, dude, when's the next raid coming out? So we're kind of expanding the idea of warforging. I mentioned we're doing it with gems. We're also adding these bonus tertiary stats. So you may get a glove one day that has an extra stat on it that does something cool. These don't count against the budget. It's just a bonus when it happens. And here's some examples of tertiary stats we're playing with. I'm not going to read all these. You guys can see the slides. Now, 
Now again, it's really unlikely, and yes, you're, unless you're very dedicated or very lucky, that you're going to have your sturdiness set because there's just not going to be that many pieces out there. You're not going to be able to stack sturdiness. And guess what? You can't reforge it. We added a little bit about will stack down there because we realize our movement bonuses are kind of difficult to understand about what works with what. So we've rebuilt the system to where pretty much any movement speed you get will work with any other movement speed up to some, you know, sane level druids. <laughs> Cleve's been an interesting stat. We played with it a little bit on the uh, trinkets in um, the most late, the latest raid tier. And we don't think it's necessarily fun to be like, I'm going to take, put on my cleave set, I'm going to take off my cleave set. But if you get it as a bonus on some of your items, hey, that could be pretty cool. You'll do a little bit of extra AE cleaving sometimes. Item squish. We tried it before. We're trying it again. Why? <laughs> I'm a pretty simple guy at the end of the day, and I have trouble understanding when I see that many zeros on the screen. Make whatever jokes you want. Most of our item inflation comes from previous raid tiers. Um, but it's much less important that Blackwing Lair gear is a massive upgrade over Molten Core gear. Yeah, people are still running that old content, and we're cool with that, but it's not that big a deal that the Blackwing Lair gear is much higher item level anymore. So we're just going to flatten out all of the big jumps that come at the, uh, the, the previous raid tiers at these, um, at these levels. This is current insanity. And these are some slightly more sane numbers. Okay, a bunch of caveats here. I hear people cheering, but I know there's people out there grumbling too. Dumbing the game down. Your relative power will not change. If you look at percentages, if you are a healer and you know how much your flash heal heals on your tank, the bar will still jump by the same amount. The relative power of 5.4 gear will not change. So if you're a, currently a heroic raider, your gear will be just as powerful as it is today relative to all the other gear and that'll still translate into going into 6.0. If it takes you five seconds to kill a Timeless Isle Gulp Frog, it will still take you five seconds to kill a Timeless Isle Gulp Frog. And I should probably say this one four or five times, but if you like to solo old content, you can still solo old content. We'll make sure that happens. We knew a lot of people were, were, you know, trying to get their Ashes of Alar, trying to get their Hammer from Ragnaros, but it turns out a lot of people do this all the time, and it, it brings a lot of, you know, extra value to the game for players who want to keep supporting it. And if you've played on the floor, the item squish is already in, and if you didn't even notice it was in, then awesome. That wraps up our presentation. Looks like we have about 10 minutes left, so we would love to entertain some questions. Um, be nice to stick to the Warlords of Draenor topics for now, though we are doing a second Q&A later on today that's pretty much open-ended. We also appear to have a giant dance floor here in case you guys want to dance while you ask the question. Mosh pit. Hi. I, I know you said that the mythic tier of raiding will stay uh, um, outside of the cross realm. I come from a very small server and we don't have any 25 man teams and most of our guilds are also very small. Um, we may have the issues coming up with a 20 man team. Um, do you have any way to address becoming, uh, switching from a 10 and 25 man option to the soul, to exclusively having a 20 man option. 
So that's completely a valid concern. Um, on, on smaller servers, the connected realms that we're unrolling and continuing to roll out um, are going to help a lot with that in terms of making sure that you have a certain critical mass on any given server, that it feels like you have a lot of active guilds to deal with recruitment and for people to find a home to raid. But that said, we recognize that this transition is not necessarily going to be an easy one, particularly for the current 10-player heroic guilds. Um, one thing that is worth noting is that the introduction of a flexible heroic mode does at least mean that as you're trying to grow upward, you actually can continue to raid as you strive to reach that 20-player mark. Previously, it was impossible to grow from, let's say, 10 to 25, because what does a 16-player raid group look like today in Mists of Pandaria? It looks like a lot of people sitting on the bench being angry. Whereas you can do 16-player, 17-player heroic, then when you get to 20, now you can begin to do Mythic. Um, we, we wanted to get this information out there ahead of time so that people can start planning. And the reality is, when we release a new expansion with new content, you are going to be progressing upwards through those tiers of difficulty. There will be a lot of people returning to the game looking for homes. And our hope is that while we know it's going to be a difficult transition for many to make, in the long run we'll be able to offer a much more streamlined experience, a much more competitive experience for the higher end heroic raiders, and a better tuned experience all around. Hey guys, uh, my question is more around the player experience with questing and garrisons. So how will you manage the suspension of disbelief that happens when, for example, you have a faced in garrison or a random event that just happens over and over and over again when you want to create a living and breathing uh, world in Dryanor? Like all the, all the things that if you just wait a little bit or camp a little bit, you will be able to do, how will you manage those rewards for players? Um, maybe you can clarify a little bit. I, I'm not sure what the garrison and phasing has to do with camping things. So, for example, when if you have a garrison, uh -huh. uh, I'm assuming that is per player and phased for that player. So right, like the I, farm. Yeah, so Particularly in that, this is the, it has to do with the living and breathing world because I don't see how, what the purpose of having a garrison is if you will not have any real consequences for it. For example, how would, why would you have a fortress if it cannot be attacked by other players, for example? Okay. So I can see, you know, interactions with other players being something that we do as we continue to develop the feature, uh, maybe in the long run. Um, I think, you know, building a base for the sake of building a base is actually really cool. Um, I think players will have a lot of fun, you know, deciding where to put their buildings and what buildings they want to use. Um, I don't think it necessarily requires that it be attacked by other players for it to be cool. Um, also, as far as its, you know, kind of phased location in the world, you got to bear in mind that 99% of the world is still not phased, right? And it's still all the kind of public adventuring area that you normally experience. So I don't think you'll be running into a problem where you're coming in and out of phases constantly um, because of garrisons. There are very predefined locations in several different zones where you can build them, but those are, you know, relatively small compared to the zone itself. It's also worth noting that we have some new tech that will help us better integrate the garrison into the world outside. Whereas with your player farm in Half Hill today, you only kind of see your own personal plots and farm phase in as you kind of walk up to the farm. Our plan is that if you have a mage tower in your garrison and you're a thousand yards away across the zone, you'll still see the silhouette of your own tower long before you get there. Hi, I'm Richard Boone, guild leader for Wild the Musical on Chandra's. Now, you were saying that you would like to get more friends working together um, to do the content on this. Where was any love for the guilds? That's our biggest uh, thing for getting friends together. Um, you know, I think are you going to bring back, uh, have group group will travel? Well, when we say friends, we, we mean that interchangeably with guild mates, right? So if you are you know, going on one of these dungeon runs with your guild mates, that's kind of what we... All we mean is that you've pre-grouped with somebody before you enter the instance. So if you group up with your guild mates and go into the dungeon, you'll get that stacking the deck bonus, for example. Okay. Okay. 
two expansions ago, you gave us a bunch of guild perks. Last expansion, and so far this expansion, we see nothing. Yeah, it's one of those systems where we feel like, you know, it accomplished what we wanted it to accomplish for Cataclysm, um, but it isn't the kind of thing where we feel like we really get a whole lot out of it by continuing to pile on more levels and more perks. If we had some awesome ideas for what perks we wanted to do that just felt like, oh my god, we have to do this, then it would make sense for us to add some levels. But we don't want to be in the reverse situation where we're, we're just increasing the level just to increase the level and then having to contrive perks to, to fill it out. Flex rating should also help guilds in a lot of ways. We think flex gives you a lot of, well, flexibility building groups and keeping a guild together and, and having different sizes of <laughs> guilds work with the content. So flex is a really good feature for guilds, I think. Uh, hey, I'm uh, Suzu Shiro from uh, Big Crits. My question was on uh, flexible rate sizes. Because uh, right now, flexible caps at like 25 people, which makes sense because every other raid site caps at 25 people. But in Warlords, flexible is the normal one and is, is the norm. And Mythic is this weird mode that requires a specific number of people. So, in, in that context, flexible cap, I mean, I mean, no other normal raid nodes capping at 25, that feels like something weird arbitrary number. I mean, why not make it 30? Why not make it 40? I mean, a lot of people, ever since you removed them, a lot of people were asking for 40-man raid spec. I thought they were crazy, but why not give it back to them? I think that's definitely an interesting suggestion. Um, there is some upper limit at which we lose confidence in our ability to make the fight mechanics scale truly seamlessly, as well as there are obviously issues that people have seen with input lag, the more people are involved, a lot of it scales exponentially in relation to the number of players present. But something like 30 is certainly a possibility, since there are social groups that are around that size today. It's not something that we have planned in stone right now, but it's something we certainly could explore. Uh, my question is directed at Mr. Hazakosis. Hazakosis? That's it. Yeah, close enough. Um, What's the status as a on, question? What's the status on character scaling for old five mans and raids? So the um, so the feature that was very briefly accessible, you're saying, um, in the recent five four patch. I think so. That's something that we we're exploring. I think the question is really how to do it correctly. We have the ability, as we've seen, you know, in, in challenge modes and proving grounds to scale item level down. We've also been exploring how to scale player level down functionally such that you keep your abilities, but maybe that their potency changes. Um, it's something that we're still working on, continuing to work on, and once we have a way that we're happy with in terms of fully integrating it into the game as part of a, a reward structure, it's something that we'll have more to talk about in the future. But we're definitely interested in finding a way to explore and let people revisit the old content in a way that feels relevant, since there are so many dungeons out there and old raids that pe people probably never saw at the intended level. So my question is about the garrison followers. When you send your followers out into the world to do a quest, do a dungeon, are they actually completing that content for you so the player doesn't have to do it, or is it garrison specific? It's actually going to be garrison specific content. It wouldn't be something where like the, the follower is, is taking uh, you know, anything away from you. Uh, we're going to craft all of that content uniquely, uh, specifically just for the garrisons. Hello, I am WatchTech, former top druid in Goon Squad, Malganis, and yeah, Malganis! So last year, or last expansion, we decided we didn't like the hassle of 25 mana raids, so we went to 10. And now we do heroics, and it seems like you're taking our content away, so what are we supposed to do? Again, understandable question, understandable position to be in. Uh, that said, I mean, Goon Squad certainly, in particular, is a fairly large community with, I, I would imagine, a number of interested heroic raiders to draw upon who may be returning for Warlords. Um, I think that ultimately there is a population of people out there who are looking to do this cutting edge, difficult content. And there will be some rearranging involved, inevitably, as happened when we went from 40 to 25. But really, we're making this as a long, as, as sort of a change with an eye towards the long-term health of the game, towards the long-term health of high-end rating. 
and that we'll be able to deliver a better experience when we can focus the design and the tuning and the content creation on a single player size. For example, right now, there are many times where we have some cool mechanic that we would like to do, but we realize it's not going to scale down to 10 players at the high end very well, so we have to leave it on the cutting floor. Going forward, we think we'll be able to deliver a higher level of content, even though we do understand that in the short term, it does put people in a difficult situation. It looks like we're out of time, so thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, BlizzCon. You're watching BlizzCon 2013, an original DirecTV production since 2008. Right. Level up to DirecTV.